Right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming this evening. It's great to see such a great turnout. Um, we're also joined by uh, quite a few people online. So we, work, we are streaming the event live. So the, um, the event will be recorded and it'll be available on, the, on YouTube for people to, to watch back if it's so chosen to. Um, before I commence with, with, the, with the presentation tonight, I'm going to ask for Pam uh, to come up and just uh, make a couple of announcements. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, yeah, thank you and welcome everybody. We're obviously delighted to be here at um, the Sports of the event uh, this evening. really important. And um, that the, the next generation are encouraged and enabled to, to enter the industry. We're all complaining about the skill shortages and shortage of workers. So, really, it's, uh, it's great to see so many young people here. And, and you really are the people. So, you're the most important people here to some degree. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, we've got um, some plans within the Institute and the Trade Association to. To look at how we can support some of these young people as they reach the end of their apprenticeship and go on as early career professionals in the industry. So I've been talking to a number of, of people in the industry about the best way to do that through some sort of um, professional development program that young people can get involved in. And obviously we'll be looking to employers to help support that. We're very grateful for, for support also from the Shaw Lodge and Apple Cross Trust. Who have uh, have indicated that they may be willing and, and able to support that. But it's really about, you know, how do we take these young apprentices but develop them into the technical managers and the technical leads and the future owners of business over the next five to ten years? And there's certainly some building blocks I think that we will need to put in there. So I, I, I just wanted to make you aware of that. And if you're interested in supporting or interested in learning more about that, then please do get in touch. Very quickly, the other thing to mention is we're also looking at, and um, we've just developed a, a short course um, on cast iron metallurgy. So this is uh, this is a, uh, a program that should be run over 18 months, um, just two or three days uh, in blocks over a period with some project work as well. So I say it's really about the production, quality control, this really shop floor operations of, of, of cast iron metallurgy. Which I think is a real gap in the market as well. So again, I think we've got our first, first cohort all, all good to go, um, but we'll certainly be looking for a, a future cohort later on in the year. So if that's of interest to you, um, thank you very much. I've gone well over my time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, so um, the last time that we did this um, students' evening, uh, I've got to say it was a, a major success um, going back to February 2020. So um, th for me to be able to add this night to my program uh, gives me real massive satisfaction. So looking forward to, to hearing from the guys um, sat over there. Um, we will be presenting an award later this evening as well to um, the uh, West Midlands um, Apprentices of the Year. So um, before we get stuck into the buffet, uh, we will be making that presentation as well. So please be patient, um, please be kind, and please listen to the uh, to the apprentices. I'm sure they're not going to let us down. Um, it's uh, no pressure, guys, but uh, <laughs> um, I know there's a lot of work that's gone into it this evening as well. So we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so I'll end over today. Thanks. Okay, well, welcome to the students' evening. This is, as, as Carl rightly said, the highlight of the year for me anyway. The whole reason why we do this is because we want to see the next generation come through. Carl and I were at college together, and uh, unfortunately, can you just click back on the presentation? Yeah, so the, the reason why we do this really is that Carl and I, I'll pick on Carl. We went to college in the, uh, <laughs> probably, we're probably swimming in this water here somewhere, bunking off, I don't know, I don't know. 
but that that was uh, Woden Road for the local family guys. You'll know it very well. And then we moved to Chance Campus. Um, this was some 20 years ago, Carl, I guess now. Long, long time ago. And, uh, oops, am I, I might just use the mouse actually. It lets me do it. What are you doing? All right. What are you doing it? Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, unfortunately, this is this was from a few, few years ago, but this was one of the Met Labs there, and that was really what was left of the family industry in terms of technical training. That's the reality of it. And for a lot of our graft, and, I'm, and Pam's in the world, but I'm in and McCarr, a lot of people, we've actually got something now, and that's the important thing to say. But that's where we were in the in the in the early two thousands. Really, had nothing. It was the death of the uh, apprentice program in the in the UK. Next slide, please. So the great news is, I think most people are aware now. We've got a, a nice shiny new foundry college there, and we've got a pattern shop. We've got an actual foundry, and we've got some offices and some and some rooms where we can do formal training as well. So a really fantastic facility. Those that haven't been there, I suggest you go and have a look. It really is a lovely facility now. Next slide, please, Simon. Right in the slide, please. Unfortunately, the college itself is useless without any technical staff to support it. And we put this slide in because we had the Magnificent Seven last time we did this, but I thought that wasn't appropriate because it didn't include our, our important leader there, which is Michaela. So to give you some idea, there are seven of us, seven of us on the teach, uh, as teachers at, at, at the college, we, and we're hopefully well led by, by Michaela there. And one of us is Dopey, and I'm not sure which one that is, but we'll, we'll be the judge of that later. Next slide, please. So I just want to introduce myself and then the other two guys will do the same thing tonight. So I'm one of the teachers there. Um, I'm the youngest, I'm the baby of the group. I've only got about 25 years experience in industry. I come from a caster design background, so I support that part of the program. I work heavily in simulation and some project management. So I bring that to the equation, if you will. And as I said before, as Carl can testify, we were literally some of the last students out of the door at the Foundry College, and that's really why I got involved. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, to, to Eddie Lindsay. Next slide, please. Is that okay? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I think um, when Dave said he's the youngest presenting tonight, I think uh, it's pretty obvious when you see the products that I was involved in. Uh, when he said he was at college 20 years ago, I was at college 40 <coughs> years ago um, at Bolton, uh, where I did my HND. Uh, in the years that have passed, uh, I always say to people that this industry put a roof over our head. Uh, and I speak to my family and my, my, my kids and my grandkids, and it also put food on the table. Uh, and I love the industry. And that's why I got involved in trying to give something back. Over the years, uh, the Foundry uh, Training College at uh, section at Bolton closed, Sandwell closed, and then Chesterfield eventually gave up the ghost. And as uh, Dave quite rightly says, uh, this is the major thing that's taken us forward. Um, I can just comment to you that the lads saw this slide earlier today and one of them has something to do with museums and he looked at the car that we used to produce parts for and he thought it was something out of the museum, so enough said. Um, I'd like just to hand over, if I can, to Albert, Albert Anderson. Okay, good evening. Um, I'm the, the third or not one of the tutors from uh, Foundry Training Services. Um, I've got just over 40 years experience in the, the industry. Uh, I was a time served part maker, so I went through the apprentice uh, system at the time, so I experienced all that. Um, I actually studied up in Scotland, if I can tell by that accent, up in Falkirk College of Technology, which again has been one of the ones that's been hit and actually no longer teaches any uh, any foundry uh, subjects up in up in that part of the country, so it's nice for me to to be involved uh, down here in in Tipton, the West Midlands. Um, 
my sort of work experience, I, I started my time with a company called Glenwood in Larbert in, in central Scotland, um, and then moved to the Weir Group um, after a couple of years. Finished my time there, and then at the age of about 29, I ended up coming south uh, and ended up joining Nissan, and I, I spent 30 years at Nissan. Um, so my most recent experience has been in producing cylinder heads uh, by low pressure die casting. So from my area of contribution towards the, the, the training company is I tend to specialise in, in the low pressure die casting part of the, the business. Um, I also spend quite a bit of time with the students on some of the softer areas of trying to prepare them for their endpoint assessment and just giving them hopefully some life skills as well that, that obviously contribute contribute towards their, their endpoint assessment. Um, I'm finding the role after 30 years in industry quite challenging, very rewarding. Um, it's it's nice to be involved. Um, I do travel quite a distance to, to, to the uh, the West Midlands to, to get involved, but I'm finding it, it's, I say, very different, but I, I really enjoy it. So as far as the rest of the team, we've got a few here. We've got Michaela, if you want to stand up, Michaela. And, um, so, so Michaela's here as, as the operations manager. And I think a, a pretty well-known character within the industry in, in this area is Chris, Chris Allen. So Chris can stand up. Um, and really, there's two people who can't be here. No, there's actually three people. There's uh, Patrick Kelly, who doesn't appear on the slide, cause we, and he's a fairly new member of the team, but he brings quite a bit of expertise on, on the sort of artistic casting, the sort of that, that specialist area. Um, and then we've got John, John Myers, and Billy Cox. Um, so I say that th the three are not not here tonight. Um, so we move on. It's cohort four we've got here tonight. So we've got four young gentlemen here tonight to to give us a little bit of a short presentation, a bit about themselves, a bit about their companies, and just to try to link some of the learning that they've they've had when they've been uh, on the on the program so far. They're fairly new into the program they're probably around about probably about 12 months slightly less than that um and bearing in mind that during that 12 months they've been hit, we've been hit by covid and we've had to do quite a lot of stuff online with them which isn't ideal for our industry but we've managed to get through and we've used we've used online we've used some of the, the platforms to to try and help us there so this is cohort four there's there's four gentlemen as i said we've now the core four is we've now have five cohorts within the organization. The first cohort are passing through Gateway now. Um, so they are passing over the endpoint assessment organization. So that's great. Um, and then we've got quickly following with cohort two. And we've hopefully, or we have got some members for cohort six coming in September. So hopefully we've got a throughput of, of, of new young people coming into the industry, which is a which is a great thing. So I would like to sort of introduce the first young gentleman to come up. So Sam, if you would like to come up and do your stuff. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Sam. I'm 18 years old. It's me, bit of a mugshot. Quick fact about me is I enjoy to play rugby and I've played for a few different teams locally to my area. And since I was able to have a job and I started in the founding foundry industry, I've been working there for two and a half years and I joined this apprenticeship pro program in September 2020. Currently working in the foundry section in my company and in that I have to be more skilled because it's a small small company in the scheme of things compared to some of the other foundries. I'm from Loughborough and Loughborough is quite well known for being the hometown of a very technical college and developed many technical universities as well. 
some information about my company. I work for John Taylor and Co. There's a, a recent picture. The company was established in Loughborough in 1784. There's a picture up there from the beginning. Uh, it's a bit smaller than that now. They've lost a fair amount of land. The company employs around 25 people. I'm the only apprentice. And the company manufactures bell castings. It's a little bit obvious. Uh, we do do some iron work that's in our framework and headstocks for when our bell hangers go out and put the bells up in towers for local churches. We do other various jobs, such as small jobs for schools and local towns and stuff in town centres and town halls. There's a picture of the bells with headstocks on. You can see the difference in the sizes there. They vary from really small in... Well, they can go from anything from like 12 inches up to 9, 10 plus feet, maybe even bigger. My company mentor is Anthony Stone. He's got 11 years experience in the industry. He was my age when he first started the apprenticeship and he's now the foundry foreman at 28. There's a picture of us working on a job. It's just us two in the foundry. There's no one else. They're looking to bring on a new apprentice soon when I'm a bit further through this course. And an interesting fact about the company is the same processes are used from when they were first established in 1784, such as the materials we use. We use a, it's like a slurry, but not quite. It's a bit thicker, more like a paste. The loam, it's the old mix they use from, as you can see the old picture, it's a mix of sand, horse muck, goat's fur, and a few, few more modern things, such as fire clay and clay additives. The process to making a, a bell. The first step to making the bell is finding the case that the customer's asked for. The size obviously varies, like I said earlier. There's a few pictures of cast iron cases of various sizes. The next step, clear out the cases and set it up on a molding table with a strickle or a sweep, as some people know it as. And once you've set the case upon the table with the strickle, we use sand bricks to, to make the molding and the shape of the bell obviously you sweep the strickle around and have guide and it says there obviously we pour at 1100 degrees and the sand bricks as well they used are they are a silica sand resin mix and that helps withstand the temperatures that we pour up and there's a few little pictures of how it's done and the holes you can see in the case in the second picture, they also work as a bit of a keyhole. They stop the lining from being, you know, unsturdy. If when we're moving it, it takes a few knocks. And then we have to build the core. This is the inside. The best analogy for anyone that might be struggling to understand the concept was the old foreman. He described it as a pork pie. You've got the crust on the outside, that's the case. The meat on the inside is the core and the metal is the jelly around the, around the lot. And there's some various stages. That's a loom core. We do do air set sand cores there for the smaller ones, but in the bigger ones like that, we have to use the loom because it needs to be dried in a drying oven. And as it says there, it prevents steaming when we pour because everyone knows steaming in a mold doesn't go well. And there's a picture in our oven. After the case and core have been dried together, we have to clamp the two halves together. You can see there, I don't know if you can see very well, but the, the core plate on the bottom is clamped to the, the case after it's turned over. That's, that's just to hold, hold the two together, obviously. And then, as you can see, the, that's the old form. And digging a hole in the back, that varies, obviously, to the size of the bell. It can be anywhere, again, from one foot to nine, ten plus foot. And then we backfill the hole once the case is in. This is to help with the cooling process. We, well, we do, we go against most foundry knowledge. We try and get slow cooling process to get as big drain structure as possible. This helps with the, with the musical properties of the bell. Because not only has it got to look good, obviously it has to sound good. And 
once it's in the ground, we light up the furnaces as most foundries do. A few pouring pictures. And the way this, this course links to my, my job is in tailors with our cast iron, where there's a bit more science, we, we have to work out the feeder size and the placement and how much feed metal we're gonna need. And obviously you can see there's a few different labels for the headstocks there, what the bells hang on. There's horseshoes, you, there's a few more that aren't on there, such as cannon retainer headstocks, all different shapes, sizes, thicknesses. So obviously lots of different calculations to work out. And once I've completed this apprenticeship, I'd quite like to be able to have open pathways into other businesses, maybe in the industry, step up into different roles in the, the industry and not be anchored down to one company in one position. And thank you for listening. If anyone's got any questions. No, that's fine. Uh, the smaller carillon bells, they're usually, they can vary between eight inches even and maybe one foot. They get machined inside and out, but the, the bigger bells, they only get, well, it's not machined, they get tuned. It's tuned on the inside and that's it. Other than that, it's metal in the usual way. Any more before I pass over? Another question for the <laughs> Neither had I. <laughs> Neither had I until until I first got there. Stephen, you're next. That's over to you. Hello, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Stephen Jakes. I'm 21 years old and I'm from a town called Retford. It's in the middle of, middle of England. Quite an old town. There's not much to do there other than have a few games of pool and go to the gym. There's nothing, real, nothing much really there. Uh, I've worked in the foundry for a little over three years now. And I only started the practice course in September 2020. Which means I was left with, well, the first year, year and a bit, I were they were, this course went about, so I tried a little bit of in-house in -house training. Then as soon as this course opened, that's when I was allowed to, well, got the opportunity to come and join this course. Yeah. Yeah, a little fact about Retford. It's one of the oldest market towns in, in the country, which market still runs weekly, every Thursday and Friday afternoon, and the odd times on a Sunday. Uh, I'm currently working in the pattern shop uh, in in my company, so I'm quite enjoying it, being there for the full three years and hoping to stay there for a few more years. Uh, a little bit about my company, it's called Furnace and White and it's in, based in Dinnington, not far from Sheffield. It's quite a, quite a young company, uh, starting up in the 1980s. Uh, there's around, well, just over 100 people that work there and I think six to eight apprentices now, all scattered around in uh, different departments, two in each one. It's a, it's a, we manufacture general steel castings with the odd, the odd uh, range of alloys. <clears throat> My company mentor is also the pattern shop manager who has been there for 11 years now and quite knowledgeable, quite, he knows what he's on about. Uh, a few of the better customers that we've had are BP and Rolls Royce. It's always nice to, nice to have customers like that. Hopefully they stick about for a few more years. And this is a process that I normally go through as a pattern maker. We'll start off with a drawing, which will tell us all the dimensions, the metal spec, and everything that we need to know for to making the part. And then we'll uh, when we've got the drawing, we'll get cut out a bit of wood, a bit of wood big enough, then mark out to size, adding on all the taper and everything that we need to need to allow for the casting to come out how we want it to. When we're happy with how it's how the layout is, we then start to build up piece by piece using plywood or pine or various hardwoods, just whatever you think appropriate for the job. 
<clears throat> then for this job, for instance, we needed a nice curve, but to get that, we had to, I had to use the lathe and make a template and keep taking bit by bit, putting it up, then taking the bits off that I needed to. Once I was happy with, <clears throat> with all the parts, and then if you can, I don't know if you can see this here, we use fillets, filler or you can use leather, leather uh, fillets, which then means it can don't get stuck in the mold. Uh, when that's all done, we put a first layer of paint on and then using plywood, there's quite a lot of small defects in it. So we use something called Brummer, which it fills up them small, them small cracks to make sure we get a better finish. Uh, when this is done, we put the second layer of, uh, layer of paint on, which then just seals everything together and we're ready to send it onto the foundry to be moulded. After the apprenticeship, I'd be willing to, well, we wanted to see if there's a high role going in either my department or if, if there's a different role in a different department, open to try other things, see where, see where things take me. But other than that, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Which is, which is best, filler or leather? What do you think? I'd say filler. Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. All right, thank you for listening. Oh yeah, uh, I'm Dan. Um, before I start, there will be a lot of humming. Can't help it, unfortunately. Um, I'm 18. My hometown is Leafield near Whitney in Oxfordshire. It's a tiny little place. Uh, if I put it, if I told you where it was on a map, you probably wouldn't be able to find it without a sat nav. Um, Whitney's famous for wooden blankets. Uh, during World War II, they became quite necessary, obviously. Uh, Elizabeth I uh, had the biggest orders. Bold it already, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. I've been in the foundry industry for a little over 15 months now. I've been working at a place called Priory Cast Products, a little bit just outside of Kingham. Not that I imagine any of you know where that is. Uh, I joined a little bit later than everyone else on my cohort. I joined in October of 2020 due to the fact that my bosses were away at the time in France. So they had to lock down. So that was, that was annoying. Uh, as I said, I work for Priory Cast Products. My company is very new. Uh, set up in 2018. Yeah, they took over from the previous owner uh, who ran the foundry for 30 years. It was more of a hobby for him, but uh, we kind of industrialized it a little bit and it's come a long way since, since then. My company doesn't actually employ five people, it's four. Uh, I'm one of two apprentices. I've been as I said, on for 15 months, the other apprentice is in, in cohort five and he is, he's only, he's only been up in Dudley once since, uh, he started. My company mainly manufactures, uh, decorative parts and window stays and fittings. Uh, it's nothing crazy. We do the odd silver part, but my mentor is Eunice Ascot. He ran, well, he didn't run a foundry. He was, he was part of a foundry in London that was mainly involved with silverware. And he thought he could do a better job of it somewhere else. So he moved to the Cotswolds. An interesting fact about my foundry is that we made the window fittings for Bletchley Park. Kind of interesting if you like that sort of thing. It's not really for me. Uh, <laughs> at the college with John Myers. Uh, 
in unit nine, we've been learning all about uh, choking points, uh, cross-sectional areas, and I don't use any of it in my foundry, so <laughs> really helpful. I mean, it's, it's interesting if I went somewhere else, but just, um, yeah, at my foundry, we tend to just whack on a bit of wax. Hopefully, hopefully it works. It's, it's, not, it's a bit of guesswork, but it does the job. Uh, once I completed this apprenticeship course, I'm hoping to maybe in like 10 years time, be a manager someplace myself, maybe do a better job of presenting than I am now. <laughs> we'll see. Um, when I was looking around well, while I was writing up this presentation, I did see that the ICME uh, did do a two-day course about um, different managing roles and uh, maybe I could give it a go. Uh, obviously, at this point in time, I still don't know what I want to do. Some say I'm 18, I could do anything at this point. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> How can I top that? Thanks, Dan. <laughs> so, hello everyone. My name is Joshua Wagner Lee. Um, I am 31. No, there's an action shot of me in the mold making at, um, at Break Engineering. I'm 31 years old. Um, I have entered the industry quite late in my life. Um, there's many reasons for this. Uh, one being I never really knew what I wanted to do with my life until I had kids and then um, I thought, right, now's about time I, uh, you know, kick myself up the butt and do something worthwhile. Um, also going back to the fact, yes, my middle name is Ragnar. Um, you don't have to say it. I do normally go by it. It's, a, it's an old Danish name. Um, it means warrior. I'm not a warrior. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked in the foundry industry for about 18 months now. Um, and at, I'm at Brave Engineering. I'm currently in the mold making uh, section at Brave Engineering. Um, I joined the apprenticeship program in September 2020. So um, it lined up pretty, pretty decently. I signed my contract to start at Brave in August. And then, you know, I mean, obviously it all started when it was online. It was very difficult online classes but we got through it. Uh, my hometown is Shotley Gate in Suffolk. Um, I don't think anyone will know where that is. Um, it was a nice place to grow up. It's famous for Bloody Point which is um, it's a section of the River Orwell where in 885 AD King Alfred um, fought off some Danish invaders um, and yeah I, I just I, I love I love that little piece of information. Um, and like, that's one of the reasons why at my primary school, our school bad with a Viking ship. Um, an interesting fact about me, which I find interesting anyway, is I, I am Norse pagan and I'm descended from um, Norse settlers from about a thousand years ago um, that settled in Suffolk, well, East Anglia, uh, all a part of Dane law. Um, so, yeah, my family, we're quite proud of our ancestry. Um, we've always you know, passed, like, from my, my father's side, it's always been passed down information about who we are and where we're from. Um, you know, I take quite, quite a lot of pride in knowing where I came from. Some information about my company. I, like I said, I work for Brave Engineering and for any of the smart people in the room, you might see where we got our name from. Uh, when they first started, they started making stuff out of bronze, aluminium, and um, iron. So the name comes from the three symbols on the periodic table. Um, yeah, brave. Uh, we are based in Woodbridge, Suffolk, and we were established in 1966. This is how it started, um, in a tiny little shed, probably about, I think it was about five or six people. Uh, and this is what we are now. Um, so as you can see, in 56 years, we haven't just survived in a competitive industry. We've, we've thrived. Um, 
the company employs about 120 people, that's including machine shop staff, but I'm the only foundry apprentice at the moment. I don't know if they're going to be taking any, any new apprentices right now. <clears throat> this is a picture of the foundry floor. Just below this, the area where I took this photo is where mold making is, and we have the track set up so it goes through mold making to painting to setting and then down to the furnace area. Uh, we manufacture high specification castings in steel alloys, sometimes alley bronze. Um, you know, some examples of what we make are uh, steel impellers, um, uh, three way valve bodies, and such like <laughs> some stuff for nuclear power. Uh, my company mentor is a man named Francis Burton. He's been in the industry about 36 years. Um, he did his apprenticeship in Norwich, I believe. Um, he's quite a patient man, which I think is quite good. Because I'm quite annoying. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, we make castings that are shipped all over the world from nuclear power plants and sub nuclear submarines in America to wind farms in Africa. Um, which I, it's one of the things that drew me to Brave as well, was like, you know, it's, it was this tiny, well, I say tiny, it's quite big, but at the same time, it's, it was a foundry just in the middle of nowhere, like nowhere knows where it is. It's just like around, like Chris came and visited us, Chris Allett over here. And he said maybe about six times, like, I can't believe it. It's in the middle of a field. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, like, you know, I found it quite amazing that, you know, just in this random rural area, um we ship stuff all over the world and i thought it was quite amazing so i'm gonna bore you now just so you're aware i'm gonna to talk to you about feeder size and placement um so unit unit nine delivered by john myers i'm not going to read out that title it's absolutely ridiculously long um but it is it's just about applying a systematic systematic approach um and I'm going to mainly talk about outcome four, which is uh, understanding basic casting design with relation to the uh, feed size and placement. Um, this is some of my work on this. Um, you can't read that, and I'm very sorry, but it is very good, I promise. All right. Um, it was it was quite hard at first, you know. You know, I I, I come from I, like my, I have no background whatsoever in the found, in, in the foundry industry. So it was quite hard at first to try and figure all this out. And when I first sent all of my uh, homework off to John, um, about three weeks later, I got an email with all of it sent back with loads of red writing all over it. So this is my second try, but it is very good now, I promise. Um, so yeah, um, it's just about you know think, uh, you, thinking about where where is the best place to you know put feeders and stuff like that. Um, that one there is just uh, that that's the calculation for calculating feeder modulus. Um, you uh, take the modulus of the casting times it by 1.2 and then bang, you've got the feeder modulus. Um, so with Dave Hall, uh, we went through a Magnusoft flange simulation where we, we created a part um, called the flange. Um, and this right here is the um, original feeder placement um, I don't have the picture um, of, the, like, of the actual simulation I did, um, but in, where's the, there we are, in this general area here, there was a lot of shrinkage porosity. Um, so I added an extra feeder. I changed uh, in this section here, as you can see, um, I changed the size of these feeders here. And I also added some chills on the other side here. Um, and then I put it through the mesh again. Um, and then I got the simulation results. And as you can see, um, in this section here, there isn't any, well, there's that little bit there, but that is here. But here before, well, see, I can't prove it because I ain't got the original picture. So you might think I'm lying, but I promise I'm not. There is, a, there is still some shrinkage here, but through everything that I was taught, I mean, no one told me to put that feeder there, but through everything that I was taught by these guys, you know, even someone like me who has no um, 
you know, background in all of this, um, I was able to, you know, figure out, you know, if I put that there, I calculated it all and I ended up with no shrinkage property whatsoever. Um, what I would like to achieve after I've completed my apprenticeship. So one thing I've always wanted to do is just work around the world, travel, um, you know, just go new places, experience new things. Um, Uh, and one thing that I've always wanted to do, and you know, I'm hoping this is where this is going to take me. So I, I, I'm making props for m movies and television. Like, aside from my family, um, I love nothing more on this planet than films and TV. Um, one of the, right, I'm going to warn you now. I'm a massive nerd. I really, I like you couldn't tell, but so. <laughs> When I was young, Lord of the Rings was my life. It still is. I'm 31, and you know, I'm, yeah, I've got Tolkien's signature tattooed on my leg. Yeah, I would show you, but I'd have to get naked. Um, and at the at the start of the film, The Fellowship of the Ring, um, there's a clip of Sauron forging the ring, um, and he's actually casting it. And I thought, wow, right? I thought that's incredible. I loved it, absolutely loved it. And um, ever since then. Um, I mean, like you can see that that's the leaves of Lorien brooch so that um, all of the fellowship wear. Um, Sauron's helmet. I mean, obviously that is an actual uh, metal for the film. I don't think they would have made that out of metal, but to think something like that made out of metal is absolutely terrifying. But I think it's very cool. Um, so yeah. Um, I, you know, I just want to. I want to be able to create something I can be proud of, and. Um, you know, something I can show my sons, you know, that, you know, when you get older and you pick what you want to do, uh, there, are, there aren't limitations. Like you, you are your own worst enemy. Um, you know, you, you need to, you know, you can achieve your dreams if you just work hard. Um, and that's me and my boys there. Um, and yeah, that's my main drive is just being a good influence to them and showing them that you know, if you work hard at something in life, you can get there. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Brilliant. <laughs> okay, well, what an absolutely fantastic job. Let's, can we give another round of applause for the for an absolutely fantastic job for that? So before I hand over to Carl for the next stage of the evening, I just wanted to put a, a shout out for anybody that's been inspired by these um, students to come and join FTS. We're always after more teachers, um, Albert, Eddie, myself. It's hard graft, it's hard work, but you can get this reward. And um, Eddie, Albert, myself, we feel 10 foot tall now listening to these guys here because we feel like we're making a difference. So I would ask people that are online, people in the audience, you can give something back. It's hard graft, it's not easy, but this is the reward for it, okay? So uh, I'll just hand over to uh, Carl, if you'd like to take over, please. And thanks a lot for your time. Uh, you should be really proud, lads. Um, I'm, I'm immensely proud to be able to stand here and thank you. So um, you should be really proud. I'm, I'm sure your employers are really proud of you as, to, as well, so. Um, I think about myself when I'm sort of your ages and sort of you sat where you are now, and I couldn't do what you just did, um, to be honest. Um, so you should be really proud. Well done. Um, I also think it's quite fascinating. Um, you all come from sort of some um, rural part, rural parts, or um, strange places that you never heard of before. Um, You've got lots of inter interesting facts about where, where you live and where you're from. Um, I won't bore you where I'm from, obviously, West Brom. We're not doing too well at the moment, like, but um, probably better not get onto football. But um, no, I think really well done, lads. Um, immensely proud of you. So thank you. Um, before. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sure. Yeah. I, I... I do apologise. Sorry, I missed something. There's, um, Andrew Turner mentioned there's a uh, a prize available for just coming on the chat. Sorry, for it's worth four and a half thousand pounds for 
uh, will the will foundry con congress thank you pam you want to come in and say that <laughs> okay you have to write a short paper, but the prize is uh, yeah. for the first page trip. Okay. Okay, thanks, Pam. So there's there's a there's a prize out there, and what I'd say is go onto the website to have a look for that. So sorry, oh, I do apologize. Oh. Sorry, I missed that. Sorry. Oh, thank you. So what I was gonna say was one one of the comments from the lads was, you know, um I wanna be able to possibly work anywhere in the world and Believe me, you will. You'll have those opportunities. Um, I was fortunate enough to, to enjoy those sorts of opportunities. And from what I've heard tonight, there's no doubt about it. You will be able to travel the world, and the world will be your oyster. So, all right, keep working hard. Um, before I open the, um, the buffet tonight, which has been kindly sponsored by TMA, <laughs> um, I have one more announcement and presentation to make. Um, this presentation is for um, West Midlands Franchise CME uh, Apprentice of the Year. Um, I'm not sure, Dave, if you'd like to say a few words about this apprentice. Sorry for putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, but um, maybe you'd like to say a few words about Yeah, it. so I, I don't embarrass Joe too much. But we have a, <laughs> and, and for the, the cohort we've just had up, we have a, a vote internally just to give the, uh, the teachers and at the branch. And we wanted to give something back. What's really important to me, Carl, and the members of branch council, the members of branch council, is that we're giving something back to the college, and there's that kind of interaction between the college and the and the branch. But um, Joe, I've, I've, I've taught Joe. He's a very polite, keen lad. I've, I've got really high hopes for him. Don't embarrass him too much. He's going to come up here in a minute, and um, hopefully this award this award will be inspirational to the next cohort. We're going to try and offer this every year. That's the plan, I believe. Yeah. I've got to put back out on the spot anybody else. <laughs> I can try and offer this every year. And um, yeah, it's just a way of acknowledging some, some really hard work and some, and some good work that he's done. So um, yeah, congratulations to, to Joe. So if you'd like to come up, Joe. Joe and... If you'd like to join us. Uh, I'd also like to ask Tony from Bathgate to uh, sponsor in the, uh, the prize. Tony, for the course, as well. Thank you very much. Okay, Joe. Um, you have this done for the camera. This uh, a kit of £250 uh, from, from back then. Also, there's a um, counter. Um, we have a certificate for you as well. Thank you very right, much. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Keep up the hard work. Well done. Well done. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. So I think everyone's really uh, come to the buffet, to be honest. <laughs> it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? Um, it's really good to see so many people uh, back here again. Um, we've been through a lot. Uh, the last two years with COVID, but let's hope we've, uh, we're making progress in that department. And um, I think we're all busy, uh, we're all doing well. And let's hope this this, this time next year we're, we're doing the same again with another group of students. But um, thank you, lads, for all the effort. And thank you to the tutors. Thank you to Dave and Simon and everyone, Albert, who supported the evening. Um, couldn't really do it without, without your support. But thanks for everyone for attending as well. It, it's made a real difference. So thank you. Thanks to everyone online as well. So unfortunately, you can't enjoy the buffet, but um, hopefully, you just enjoy the rest of your evening. And um, thanks again. Cheers.